So I'm going to ask Carla to go first, please, um, and, uh, and give your contribution. Thanks, Carla. Thanks, Julie, and thank you, everyone, for joining us today. I'm, I'm really honoured to be speaking alongside Michael and Sammy. I'm really looking forward to their contributions and, and the questions that we can have afterwards. I wanted to say at the outset that in Amnesty's report that we published in February of this year, where we for the first time conclude that Israel is committing the crime against humanity of apartheid, we demonstrate that Israel is committing that crime wherever it exercises control. So that's in the occupied Palestinian territories, where obviously um, that's Michael's remit as special rapporteur. In Israel itself, obviously, Sami will have a wealth of experience and expertise as a member of the Knesset and against Palestinian refugees who are denied the right to return. Our report was the first time that we made that conclusion, but obviously we're following many others who have concluded similarly. Many Palestinian organizations, Israeli organizations, Yeshdin and Bet Salem, Human Rights Watch, of course, last year, and now the UN Special Rapporteur, Michael Link, in his recent report. We, of course, wonder if the UN established Commission of Inquiry um, that will report in June for the first time will, will draw a similar, similar con conclusion. And we're urging the International Criminal Court to consider the applicability of the crime in its investigation that's ongoing. Some people find the use of the term apartheid controversial or unhelpful, and we understand at Amnesty that not everyone is going to use the same language as us right now. Amnesty's report was more than four years in the making. Um, so others, whether that's civil society organizations, um, political parties, states, will take their own time. But we do think that it's really important to point out that there is a growing international consensus on this. And while the Israeli government fiercely denies it, many Israeli, former Israeli politicians have accepted it. As far back as 2002, former Attorney General Michael Benyer said, we established an apartheid regime in the occupied territories. And I know that um, he's said similar more recently, and, and Michael's going to mention that. Um, also, um, Minister Yossi Sarid, sorry, former Israeli Environment Minister Yossi Sarid, in 2008 said, what acts like apartheid is run like apartheid and harasses like apartheid is not a duck, it is apartheid. And that's just a few examples. And for us at Amnesty, um, you know, as Yossi Sarid has said, we do think it's important to call apartheid apartheid. When you look at the evidence, some of which you'll hear today, the legal basis is clear. The crime of apartheid is being committed in plain sight, as Michael has said, and the international community must ensure that Israel faces consequences as a result of that. When Amnesty says apartheid, we mean the crime against humanity of apartheid as defined in international law. And in the Apartheid Convention and the Rome Statute, apartheid is defined as systematic, systematic oppression and domination with inhuman, inhumane acts perpetrated in, in order to maintain that system. So you need to have both of those things. In our report, 280 pages, um, we document the systematic nature of oppression and domination that Israel imposes. And that's through laws, policies, and practice. We describe massive seizures of Palestinian land and property, unlawful killings, the forcible transfer of Palestinian people from their land, drastic movement restrictions, the denial of nationality and citizenship, and all this amounts to apartheid under international law. I'm sure that Michael and Sammy will talk more on some of those things and others. Today, I want to talk a little bit about land rights specifically and how that relates to forced evictions and home demolitions, which is a current priority for us. Palestinian citizens of Israel are effectively blocked from leasing land on 80% of state land. The Negev region is a prime example of this and how Israel's discriminatory planning and building policies are designed to 
maximize land and resources for Jewish Israelis at the expense of Palestinian citizens. In the Negev, instead of zoning Palestinian Bedouin villages as residential areas, since the 70s, the authorities have zoned the villages and the lands around them for military, industrial or public use. So residents of unrecognized, unrecognized villages are considered to be illegal squatters. They're unable to apply for building permits because the land is not designated as residential. As a consequence, the buildings of whole communities have been repeatedly demolished. By contrast, Israeli courts have retroactively approved Jewish communities built without building per permits, and that's in the same area as well. In East Jerusalem, Palestinians comprise 60% of the population, but only 15% of the land is designated for Palestinian residents. According to Peace Now, between 1991 and 2018, only 16% of applications for building permits approved in Jerusalem were for Palestinians in East Jerusalem. 38% were for Jewish settlements in East Jerusalem and the rest were for West, for, uh, West Jerusalem. In Area C of the West Bank, uh, Palestinians are only allowed to build on estimated 0.5% of the land and most of that is already, um, already built up. Meanwhile, 70% of the land in Area C is allocated to settlements. In July the, um, 2019, the Security Council, um, the Israeli Security Council cabinet promised to grant building permits for more than 700 Palestinian building and um, house, housing units. By contrast, it, it promised building permits for 6,000 um, housing units for Jewish settlers. But by the end of 2020, only one building permit had been issued for Palestinians. And by contrast, more than a thousand had been issued for Jewish settlements. So those statistics are obviously staggering, but behind that, those statistics is the devastating reality for Palestinians who cannot get building permits, are forced to build houses without authorization, and then their houses are demolished sometimes repeatedly. There's a quote in our report from Nitham Abu Kabash, who is a resident of, West Bank, of the West Bank, who I just wanted to, to share with you. He said, my kids are always scared. We are always scared. When the army comes in and your children are terrorized and crying and outside in the pouring rain, I promise you there is no human being on earth that is meant to be able to handle that. The only way to describe it is as a tragedy. I ask anyone with a conscience to pressure the Israelis to do one thing, to stop the demolitions and to allow us to live our life. We're not asking for much. I will end there because I think I've run over a little bit, but I just wanted to quickly say that we are at Amnesty, we're urging all parliamentarians to speak in parliament about the systematic discrimination that Palestinians face and really press the UK government to hold Israel to account. And that, that needs to be more than just statements. There needs to be conse like concrete consequences for Israel. And a, a straightforward first step on that would be to ban the import of settlement goods, which obviously finance and legitimize um, illegal settlements, and also to support international justice processes such as the Commission of Inquiry and the ICC investigation. Thanks very much, Carla, for um, setting the scene really of what the reality of what is going on at the moment.